Lord, we thank you, Father. We, we, we sense the, the, the grace of God on today. And Lord, I just want to ask you, Lord, we set our hearts to you, Jesus. Lord, I ask you that we would get a sense of what is in your heart for today. And that, Lord, we would get a sense of what is in your heart for this hour we live in. Lord, I do want to thank you for Terry and the ministry you've given him. And God, I just want to thank you that, that you have sent him to us here and that he glorifies Jesus in everything he does. And Lord, I just want to say today, Father, we just want to pray that Jesus Christ would be glorified in this place. Lord, we know that you are jealous for your son. And I ask you, Lord, let the jealousy of God fill this place today, that we would leave with a jealousy for the Son of God. Father, the jealousy you have for your Son, I pray, Lord, would burn in our hearts, that we would be like Phineas who took the spear and jabbed it into everything that was contradicting, Lord, what is in your heart. Lord, let us have the jealousy of God for your Son in our hearts, Lord. God, we know that you are committed to your son being exalted and glorified. And we ask you, Lord, that in this meeting, in this time, that Jesus Christ would be glorified. Jesus Christ would be exalted. We invite you right now, Holy Spirit, to move. Lord, I, I just pray that you would move today. Lord, move today however you want to move. We open our hearts to you right now. Just, just where you are, open your heart up to the Lord. Just open your heart up to the Lord. Lord, we just ask you today, that you would accomplish everything you want to accomplish today, Lord. Lord, like Terry was talking about yesterday, let us hear the still, small voice of God. Even right now, Lord, I pray. Lord, let your spirit move, God. Let us get a sense, Lord, of what you're speaking. I pray, Lord. Let's hear your heart. Lord, we just pray, increase your presence. Increase your presence in this place, Lord. Father, we just say what Jesus said about himself, that on the Son, the Father has set his seal. That the endorsement of God is on his Son. 
is on the Son. And Lord, we just pray right now that it would please you to reveal your Son in us. God, we just pray that you would reveal your son in us and form him in us. God, I ask you, Lord, let us get a sense of what the Holy Spirit is saying to this church, to the church in this hour of history. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. 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 You may be seated. You can get the outer court people to come on in to the Holy of Holies. Uh, so anyway, we won't hold that against them. There is redemption. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can still be a wise virgin if you come on in, so the door's not locked yet, but uh, um, <laughs> I, I do think today is going to be really special. I, I just have a sense of what God's going to do is going to be special. Um, I, I, thought, <laughs> I thought something Terry said last night was, was absolutely profound, and, and again, you, you're, you're thinking about ice cream and ribs, and all of a sudden he drops his truth bomb, and I just was thinking about it this morning. And the Lord just started giving me a tremendous amount of revelation. I, I want to share, I'm not going to, I promise I'm not going to take long, but I want to share just real quick that what, from what Terry was sharing last night, that I, I just want to share just real quick, because I think what he said was so important. I'm going to even ask Terry, if it doesn't interrupt what he felt like God is going to say, to share that part again. But when he talked about the, the father leading an internal movement, um, if you could share that again when you come up, that would be really great. But what I, um, I never ever connected, I want to turn to Luke 17 real quick. I never ever connected until this morning after thinking about what Terry shared from Luke 17, 21, that, that uh, when, you know, what G, or Luke 17, verse 20, I never ever connected the end time move of God with the establishment of the internal kingdom. And it just, be, just, just came all, I mean, just, an incredible amount of revelation just came to me this morning when the Lord said the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. But here's what I got to say is the kingdom of God is coming. <laughs> it's just not going to come the way a lot of people think, but it is coming. And there is coming, obviously, an external kingdom, but, and that's in the age to come. But the, the coming of God, the coming move of God is not going to be with, with outternal, external signs to be observed. Uh, they're not going to say, look, here it is or there it is. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. In other words, what I believe Jesus is saying here is it's not only just a principle, but it's actually a prophecy of what he's going to do at the end of the age. And that just became revelation to me this morning. I never had seen that before. The, the Father is leading right now. We're, and this is not something to come. This is happening at this very moment. The Father is leading an internal movement of the kingdom being established within us. And I believe, I believe if, you're, if you came to a Terry Bennett conference and you're on day three of a Terry Bennett conference and you haven't left, then you really do want this. <laughs> okay, so I'm speaking to people who really want this. You have been... You, you, this is this God has selected you for this. This is an end time move of the, of the Lord leading to God's eternal purpose being fulfilled at the end of the age. The father is leading an internal movement. That is, and, and this is what I wrote down. It is the, the, uh, the father is leading an internal movement. That is the pregnancy described in revelation chapter 12. And what I'm going to say is like, God, this has been recorded, so um, <laughs> it sounds crazy. I believe that what God is beginning to initiate, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I believe what God is initiating and intending to do right now through what Terry is leading is intended to give birth to Revelation chapter 12. 
I truly, truly believe it. And it begins with the internal kingdom being established within a people. That internal kingdom being established within a people is going to lead to the external kingdom of God coming, just like it says in Revelation chapter 12, the, the ones who had the internal kingdom, the king formed in them, will say, now the salvation and the kingdom of our God has come, and the, his authority has come, for the accuser of our brethren has been cast down. In other words, those who have had the internal kingdom formed in them are going to take part in seeing the accuser of the brethren cast down from heaven and the kingdom of God coming to the earth. I, I, I truly believe this. I believe that God is orchestrating an internal movement, and this is the beginning of that. And you've been chosen to be part of that. <laughs> um, when, you, when you think of an internal movement, it's kind of like a pregnancy. It starts in seed form. You can't see it. No one sees it. It's hidden. I mean... You can't put definition to it. It's hidden. No one sees it. It starts small and it grows. And slowly you begin to see the forming of that. And no one can see what's happening until the birth takes place. I believe that's what, we're, that's what this, is, this movement is. It is a movement. It is just, it is a God movement that, that the Lord is releasing right now. It's a recovery of Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's a recovery of the internal kingdom inside of us. It's a recovery of Galatians 2.20 that Christ would live in us, that we would no longer live. Um, it's leading to Christ being formed in a people. It's leading to an individual and corporate fullness. I mean, this is, I mean, it's, it's really, truly amazing, amazing that God is giving birth to this. It's stunning, honestly. If we just get our, if we can really believe, if we can just, I mean, it sounds crazy that, okay, you're talking about the end of the age, you're talking about eschatology, you're talking about prophecy, being, but I'm not saying when it's going to happen, but I'm saying I believe the beginning of that movement is starting right now, and God is looking for a people to agree with him and actually believe him in what he's saying. And, uh, you know, it's, it's easy with an external movement to recognize it. With the healing movement, you can easily see it because people are getting prayed for for healing. For a worship movement, you can see it because everyone's raising their hands and praising and worshiping God. For the prophetic movement, you can see it because people are prophesying over everyone. For the faith movement, you know, they're declaring the word of God to get things. But, you know, all the external stuff you can see, this internal movement is a lot harder to recognize. And a lot of people don't want to pay the price for that internal movement. Because they want the external. But I, I believe that there, God is in this, in this meeting today setting people apart to say, this is what I was born for. This is why I exist. Is I was born for this. God, and I believe God has, you know, the, the, if I could describe it in our experience is, you know, we have tried all these different things. It's like, we don't fit here and 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 we don't fit here. And all of a sudden you realize, aha, this is it. And I believe other, raise your hand if you have that feeling of testimony. Um, okay. Yeah, almost everybody. There's a reason you feel that way. And because God has marked you for this particular time and this particular hour for the fulfillment of end time prophecy. That's a bold statement. And I'm like, okay, Doug, you can edit that out so it doesn't go out there. But I, 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 I truly believe in it. Again, Terry is going to know more about that than me, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. But I, I absolutely believe we are in historic times. We are in historic times. We are in prophetic times. We are in the battle of the ages. It has come upon us. And I believe you, if you're here, you have been marked for this particular calling. And so I just wanted to say that. I just felt the Lord, Lord to say that. But um, we're going to call Terry up in a minute. But before, just a couple quick announcements. If, if you want to be notified of, uh, of the videos when they're posted, you can go to videos.restorationlife.org and you can uh, get the videos. You can, they, they should be online already. Um, and if you want to be notified about 
uh, future conferences or events, you can go to email at restorationlife.org and get on our email list. We will not promise you will not bombard you with emails. We'll, we'll only do ones that are necessary. So anyway, I just wanted to say all that. And then uh, the other thing is, the other announcement before I call Terry up, if you have any children in here that are fifth grade or under and they need child care, they can go in the back and there's, there's child care. So anyway, let's go ahead and welcome Terry and just thank God for him and all he is. And yeah, love you. I love you. Yeah. So appreciate. Okay, good. good. Hey, Terry agreed. I feel good. Okay. <laughs> Whew. I'm always a little nervous. Like, you know, I'm going to say something and Terry's like, well, that's not quite it, but you know, good try young man. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> it's usually the other way around. I'm the one who needs the correcting. <laughs> anyway, uh, by the way, uh, the summer conference, uh, June, the first weekend of June, of course, is going to be dealing with this same dynamic of the internal kingdom. I'm just saying that I don't usually say much about the conferences uh, that we have on a yearly basis, but um, the nutshell of the conference is, you'll, I think you'll appreciate this, as we watch this work in us and among us, is for God to do a new thing, new to us, not to him, as Josiah said, he must bring to an end the old. And uh, to attain his goal, he is bringing to an end the former things that we have known. And uh, the, the quicker we can let go and continue the journey with him, because to not let go is to bring stagnation in the journey. Stalemates us. The enemy checks us by an old wineskin issue. So uh, no, understand, no wineskin can ever contain the fullness of Jesus Christ. There's not such a wine skin. That wine skin would be God. There's no such thing. Even in the, what we call forever of eternity, we, each of us, and collectively will be being made into a new wine skin capable, marked by the ages to come and the release of the Lord in those ages to receive more of him than we've had in the previous age. All I'm saying is the knowledge of God is unending, experientially, the knowledge of God. So uh, keeping with that, we, are, we find our place in the present place of a wineskin that by principle, the Lord said this, he never pours new wine into an old wineskin. That's a principle of God. This nonsense of crying out for revival is a cry for new wine to come into an old wineskin, and it's stupid. <laughs> he doesn't work that way. It's our understanding of revival. What you'll get in that is the same old, same old. What you won't get is an internal kingdom, an increase of the Lord himself. You'll get an increase of things. Isn't that what we've seen in revivals? What you don't get is an increase of the Lord. Because the new wine is the Lord, not things. So you can get in revival things, but you won't get the Lord. Say, well, man, isn't healing the Lord? No. It may be of the Lord, but it's not the Lord. <laughs> There's a difference. The healing movement sought healing, not the healer. That's absolutely true. Faith sought faith, not he who is faith. That's the faith movement. The prophetic sought the voice, not the person. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad, John? And everything's created around the stuff. So anyway. That's the wineskin issue, why the Lord's devastating our wineskin. If you understand it, you appreciate it because he's offering us himself. He's offering us something of himself that we've never drank of before, ate of him before. That will always be true, so get used to it. Become a wineskin that can be taken down quickly and easily by the Lord. Because you're, you and I are going to come to a measure of his fullness in each wineskin, and you'll need to become another wineskin. So that's the way the Lord taught it. 
That's the way the Lord was very specific about it. Again, the principle is God will never pour the newness of himself into the old wineskin. The present wineskin right now is meant to die. Then the Lord will do what he wants to do. <laughs> and not before. That's his own principle. And he will not bypass it. There's no shortcuts in this, my friends. As a present wineskin, I can't be asking, come fill me, Lord, in my present condition. He's not going to do it. He's going to bring the old down, raise up the new, and fill that. <laughs> Don't you just love him? <laughs> he doesn't think like I do. That's obvious to me. <clears throat> anyway, so, well, it's, it's such a joy for us to be with you guys, all of you guys, uh, those who are from this area as well as those who are not from this area, our joy is uh, the sharing of the Lord Jesus together. And not just in this way, but all the ability to talk with you guys, get to know you more and more, that's a privilege. It's a joy to be around the Lord's people. And I, when I say I love you guys, that's not some trivial thing I'm saying, just, oh, yeah, I love you. That's not what I'm saying. I love the Lord in you that I see, and it's beautiful to me. Man alive, guys, we see enough that's not the Lord. It's, it's pretty beautiful to see the Lord in people, don't you think? <laughs> I need more of him in me so y'all can see more of him. I do. I agree with that. But I appreciate the Lord I see in you guys and your hunger for the Lord, or else you wouldn't set through. These meetings, I'm with Brian. You left long ago, like before they got started. <laughs> That's the safe time. Don't come is the safe place. <laughs> anyway, so this morning, <clears throat> we're going to look at, uh, as I said last night, what I believe, again, I agree with Brian, when you look at what's going on, and this, by the way, there was a sign to this in the heavens. Y'all know that, don't you? Last September. I mean, know that. The stars aligned. And in that alignment, the woman was giving birth to the child last September in the heavens. So it's not off base, Brian. It's in keeping with what God promised. He's already given the heavenly sign of what he's going to do spiritually. And he's going to accomplish it in somebody. <laughs> I'm just volunteering. How about you? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Be it done unto us according to our faith. That's where we're going this morning. The importance of the door that Christ is accessed by what's called the faith of the Son of God. And so we'll go there in Galatians chapter 20. You can turn there. I, I spoke a little bit about this last night, but I want to hit this more clearly this morning. You will know, as I do, the overwhelming abundance of scriptures that point to Faith in the Lord, faith in Christ. I want to say it that way. It is never a faith in things or for things. It is a faith of the Son of God in the Son of God that we're dealing with. Just want to be clear. Uh, I say that particularly because of my own being discolored by what I watched in the faith movement, I was never a part of it, had no desire to be, because I knew from the beginning that's a bunch of nonsense. We're just having so-called faith for stuff, stuff that's got a hold of us that we don't even need. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, God wants you to have the best. That would be Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> If you don't have the best car, you can still have the best person. <laughs> I, I find that it's not so important as to what car you have, it's who's driving it. <laughs> what engine is in the thing? <laughs> you know, if you like fast vehicles, get Jesus inside. <laughs> Galatians 2.20 is uh, such a loaded passage of Scripture. Uh, I have been crucified with Christ. And that's the way Paul saw that. It's not just that Jesus died for me. 
but Jesus died as me, and I died with him. That's what it means to be crucified with Christ. This is the embracing of the cross, not just in its work, but in its life. God's life is lamb. Crucified. I just want you to understand, we're dealing with eternal matters of the life of God. It is sacrificial, not self-centered. The issue will be try and stop God from laying down his life for you. You won't be able to. That's already been proven. Past tense. But God is sacrificial. And humanity has been invited into that life of I no longer live, the death to the self-life, Christ lives. So Paul's very, this, this passage here is one of the most loaded passages in the New Testament as Paul is explaining, you know, here in Galatians 2.20 and beyond, but it's not the only place, but it's one of the most powerful that I know of. I have been. He sees that what Christ did on the cross is its eternal nature to it. The eternal nature of God and to bring us into Christ in so that that nature, that divine nature may enter us by Christ entering us and us be partakers of the Christ divine nature. We become partakers of the divine nature. That means Christ has come into us, and he's come into us not as Santa Claus. He's come into us as a life, the life, the eternal life of the Godhead. Jesus was emphatically clear about this. The Father living in me does his work. How's he living? He's living by the life of another living in him, the same way we're to live. We're to live by the life of Christ living in us, not by the old life, which is actually death. Anyway, that's the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Which is more effective, my friends, when you've got a miserable life and you're sick and tired of it and your con demons are helping you to contemplate suicide and contemplate anything and everything but the real answer? Which is more effective? A religion that says one day it's going to be okay or a gun to the head blowing your former life right out of you, boom, and your life is gone and an entirely different life comes inside of you called Christ, which is more effective. The gospel gun <laughs> is the end of the former life that we hate and the bringing in of the life of Christ that is eternal. Is that not right? Just want to be clear with us. So suicide's not the answer. Christ is. You want to die? The Lord wants you to too, but not by a gun to your head. <laughs> by a spiritual reality of letting go of the old to receive the new. Isn't that beautiful? And it's the answer to everything in this earth. I guarantee you that. Every miserable, wretched person, talking about myself, <laughs> right at the front of the list, their answer lies in an entirely other than life. That's the beauty of I, the I life, am crucified with Christ. If we can only see it, what are we giving up? I'll tell you what we're giving up. We're giving up a miserable, wretched, former life. That's what we're giving up. Isn't that true, guys? Think of your friends and your neighbors and work people who are miserable, and they don't know where to turn. I, you know, you may, they may not even know how miserable they are. Everybody else around them does, but they may not know it. <laughs> it's, it's so easy, isn't it, guys? I mean, I shared this in reality. It's so easy for me, for all of us, to see those attitudes and respond to the attitude without ever really seeing what's going on with people. They're miserable. I mean, they got all kinds of problems. I'm not placating their problems saying, oh, poor little thing. No, that's, they, they create problems with their problems. 
There's no doubt about that. But I'm saying, God help us to see something deeper than just the outward manifestations. What's really driving this is an inward nature of a fallen Adam. Adam reproduced himself and populated the entire world. And we have a, an entire, uh, let's just say it this way, an entire race of Adams. Miserable, wretched beings out of fellowship with God. That's what's going on. He could only, once he failed, he could only reproduce his own kind. And he's populated the entire globe with his kind. Sinners by nature. You don't become a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner by nature. You're born that way. You have to be born again to get out of that nature. <laughs> Christ in you is an entirely different nature. Say, man, well, I learned to sin growing. No, no, you were a sinner. Sinners do what they do best, sin, just like Tigger. He bounces. <laughs> <laughs> Don't expect sinners not to sin. The answer is Christ. There is no other answer and no better answer. So, so anyway, I'm crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who lives. God, make that true of me. <laughs> That's the problem, is I, life, can still live, even as a believer. The I life, not the former old man now, put away in the new birth, but the I life asserting itself. It was self that brought sin. You see what I'm saying? So the nature of Adam is out of us, and the nature of Christ, Christ is our life, even if it's a seed, is in us. But that doesn't mean our self-life is conquered. And the battleground is our self-life. And the answer is the internal kingdom, Christ in you. Him taking the land, just like they had to take Canaan. He's got to take us and drive all the ites out, the I-ites. <laughs> Somewhere amongst the ites, Mark, there was an I-ite in every one of them, wasn't there? Just like there is in me. There's an Amalekite, and there's a Jebusite, and there's a this ite and that ite, and good night, there's all kinds of ites. <laughs> And the more you come to know the Lord, the more you see how many ites there are filling the land that we are. And uh, you, sometimes you begin to wonder, Lord, where are you in there? <laughs> Total confusion down inside of me here. But the Lord uh, appears at first as a seed. That's how he comes in. So anyway, we'll get to that in a second. But <clears throat> it's no longer I who live, but Christ living in me. That's a statement by the Apostle Paul. And Galatians is one of the early books of the New Testament. The first book Paul wrote is this book. And he's already saying that, Brian. That's incredible, isn't it? And, I, you know, later he's going to say some other things that let you know that it wasn't all wrapped up even then. But already he sees it. He sees the necessity of the I life, the self life being dealt with devastatingly. Every problem in humanity is not just coming from the sin nature, it is, but the sin nature comes from self assertion, self exaltation. Every problem we face is coming from self selfishness. Every single one of them. Every problem that arises, I'm, I'm no doubt about it that demons are all over that, but they don't have to initiate it. It's already there. Adam and his wife made the choice for self. They came into the race. Anyway, so it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, here it is, I live by the faith. That's the way it is in the Greek. 
I live by the faith actually of the Son of God in the Greek. The faith of the Son of God. In the Son of God is correct, but it's of the Son of God first is what I want us to see. I said it last night, I'll say it again, we'll go to more scriptures than this, but faith, God's faith, let's say it that way, is not in fallen man. Nothing truly spiritual is until Christ shows up inside. He is the source of all spirituality. Christ himself is. He doesn't come to give us spiritual things. God gave us his son to be spiritual in us, to bring the spiritual kingdom, the internal kingdom. The internal kingdom, internal kingdom is the spiritual kingdom of God. What I'm saying to you is this. God is the spiritual, the Godhead. He is spiritual. Heaven isn't. God is. Can you hear that? The created thing is not what's spiritual. The creator is. I'm making a distinction, a necessary distinction. Let's be clear here. What makes you and I spiritual is the measure of Christ in us and nothing else. Nothing you do or do not do in the sense of restricting yourself makes you spiritual. You can deny yourself and not be spiritual. There's monks doing that all over the world. That doesn't make you spiritual. Am I saying you, we don't need self-denial? I'd be uh, going against the scriptures if I said so. But it's a denial self coming from the Christ within us. I no longer live. Christ lives. There's self-denial. Christ is the source, the one and only source of true spirituality in anyone. The church is not spiritual without Christ in it. Talk about us, the church. Yes. I'm going to go to church and get my spiritual, you know, here we are, what we said last night. I'm going to go to church this morning on Sunday because we need to. And I'm going to get my spiritualness today. If Christ is not being released, nothing spiritual is going on, and this is just a social meeting. And its value is only social, which is nothing. <laughs> Aren't y'all glad y'all came to hear that? <laughs> you already knew it anyway. I'm just reminding you. <laughs> if we can be spiritual without Jesus, why do we even need him? If our gathering can make us spiritual, why? what's the need of Christ? It's the release of Christ, the increase of Christ. Christ. Have I said that enough? Christ. Let me say it one more time. Christ. We get in the picture, aren't we? Jesus, the Lord, he's the source of spirituality. That's why I've been saying what I'm saying. You can pray until your voice is lost and inwardly you don't know what to pray anymore, and it will help you not the least little bit if you don't get to the person. Prayer is only a tool to get us to the Lord. The point is get to the Lord. <laughs> and if the Lord and being born again is in us, you don't have far to go anyway. You can cock your head, oh God of heaven, and, and God help us in this. And then you hear a voice from within saying, yes. <laughs> And the Lord kind of, you know, sends an angel to get your head and go, <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> I, granted, for me, such a small mustard seed that I didn't even know he was there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> He's so surrounded by the, the, the ground in me, the, the self in me, the soil. It needs to grow and break out of the soil in me so that he can be seen. No seed can be seen till it gets out of the dirt that we are. We were created from it. Isn't that right? Created our bodies right from the dirt and then went, 
breathe right into us. We're the soil that's hiding the seed. I'm telling you, we are. Isn't that right, Mark? Sad but true, isn't it, Michael? <laughs> I can't see Jesus. That's because you're seeing me. Anyway, I'm using myself at least. I don't want y'all to feel condemned. <laughs> That's the last thing I want to do, say anything offensive. <laughs> well, at least we can laugh about it, huh? My word, when you start talking about Jesus, everything seems offensive. <laughs> That's the problem. Especially inside the church. What's called the church? <laughs> it's because the church is a thing instead of a living being and a people. Anyway, so Paul sees it clearly. The life which I now live in the flesh, right now he's saying, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. I do not dullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. He's saying this. You can take the law, all outward stuff, by, by the way. You understand the law was completely outward. It pointed to a spiritual person of which it did not contain. The whole of it was pointing right to Christ, the life the law came through Moses, John chapter 1. Grace and truth came in Jesus Christ. Are you saying, Terry? No, let me, let's just be clear. Is that passage saying truth wasn't in the law? That's exactly what it's saying, because truth is a person, not precepts. Truth is Jesus, and Christ wasn't in the law. He's in you. He does not inhabit stuff not even buildings. You, you are the be building being built to be the dwelling place of God. Yes. Isn't that beautiful, brother? Isn't that beautiful? God loves you. He could care less about the buildings. They're great places to meet, especially when the weather's bad. <laughs> so I'm not on some anti-building thing. I'm glad I've lived in a house. Glad we have a place to gather. It's not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying this, though. This is not what does it for God. Edifices, you know, I mean, how, you can see this in the Old Testament. Here they build this temple, Solomon does, and the first thing God, pretty much the first thing God says to Solomon, I don't dwell in buildings built by men's hands. I, if I'd have been Solomon, Larry, I'd said, why didn't you tell me that before? <laughs> How did that tidbit of information get missed in this process? <laughs> but it's best said afterwards. I agree. It's best said afterwards. Build it and then make the statement. I'm not going to live here. <laughs> what? <laughs> I want in you. <laughs> Again, but Lord, this thing looks a whole lot better than I do. <laughs> I agree, but I still want any. <laughs> anyway, the Lord's persistent, isn't he? That's the church's problem. <clears throat> We're wanting him to come and stop all of this, and he's wanting to come within and stop me. That's the problem. Houston, we got a problem. I've identified the problem. We're praying, come, Lord Jesus. He said, yeah, I've been trying to. <laughs> the soil in you, son, happens to be quicksand. <laughs> Why that conjures up way too much imagery. <laughs> it's like, that's your picture of the Lord. Somebody throw me a rope. I got to get out of here. <laughs> this Bennett character, he's quicksand. <laughs> anyway, so 
All right, so this is the dynamic of Galatians 2.20. <clears throat> we see that faith's beginning in us is Christ in us. So that's what uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 says. I want us to look at this passage as well. 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, here's Peter saying as well what Paul's understanding is that it is Christ in us that's the source. Christ is the source of everything godly. You believe that? Everything spiritual, everything godly is source is one source, Christ. There's no other source. So we see that in Peter, if I can ever find it. Is that Old or New Testament, by the way? Second <laughs> Peter chapter 1. So Simon Peter, verse 1 as well. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have received a faith. Notice that language. Have received a faith. Isn't that beautiful, sister? Received a faith. What did we receive? We received a person. And when we received that person, we received a mustard. I hear this. I want to be clear. Matthew 13. Kingdom is like a mustard seed. Can you hear that? It's key that we understand it. Christ's entrance into us is as a mustard seed. It's that small when he comes in, when we're born again. The kingdom is like a mustard seed planted in the ground. Matthew 13. That's a powerful amount of Jesus, whether we believe it or not. Now, I don't want him to stay as a mustard seed, do you? In seed form, he's meant the, the seed's purpose. Because you guys understand, life is not in the soil. You're not the source of life. Life is in the seed, Christ in you. The full potential of all that God wants is only in the seed, not in the soil. Can you hear that? The harvest, therefore, is the fullness of the seed, not the soil, not us, not a bunch of us, not a lot of us. It's the fullness of the seed. Life is in the seed. That's Genesis 3.15. The seed is going to crush the head or bruise. You know, isn't that right? The devil's going to bruise his heel. He's going to crush the head of the serpent. The seed. Even the seed crushes the head of the serpent in you and I. Even just this original smallest amount of Jesus in us, a mustard seed size, is its picture. But what's it, that's not all it says. But that seed, if we allow the Lord to increase, dominates the entire garden. You know what it says, Mark? Go back and read Matthew 13. The Lord doesn't come to stay small. He comes to take over. <laughs> he becomes bigger than everything else inside of me. There's the kingdom. That's exactly what Matthew 13 says. It's what Jesus said in Matthew 13. Becomes bigger than every other tree in the garden. It shows his supremacy and it shows his dominance. He will, this is the truth of this, he will tolerate no rivals within us. No other lovers bidding for our hearts above him. Is that not true? It's absolutely true. First love was what the church at Ephesus left. They didn't lose it. Go back and read it in Revelation 2. They left their first love. You leave love for another. That's exactly what they did, and that's what the church of Jesus Christ, too much of it in our time, has done as well. We have left our first love. We didn't lose it. We left it. Other things have lured us and seduced us. Anyway, that's a whole other message. I'm just touching it. But Christ coming in, the faith of the Son of God, Paul calls it, this faith we have received, Peter refers to. I'm just doing a few scriptures here. This faith comes in when Christ comes in. Now, <clears throat> the kingdom, here's the point in what I want to get to in this. The inward kingdom cannot be known by outward things. 
That's Luke 17. It does not come with outward signs. Here's the bummer if you see it that way, or joy, depending on how you see it. The inward kingdom can't be felt by your sense of feeling. The inward kingdom can't be seen by your eyesight, heard by your ears, smelled by your sense of smell, or tasted. The five senses cannot detect the inward kingdom. Then what's the key? The faith of Christ in you. The certainty does not lie in your five senses, or else it would be shakable. The certainty lies in the faith of the Son of God in you, an unshakable kingdom. Faith comes then by hearing, hearing the Word of God. And we either believe the Word of God, that's beyond just the Scriptures, though it includes the Scriptures, not just the written, though, the declaration of the person. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. I can say, oh, yeah, man, that's, no, no, no. It's by believing in him who is speaking and has spoken and has accomplished what he's accomplished. The battleground is going to come to you and I in the internal kingdom struggle. I'm saying this to you. To be rewired away from external stimuli to an internal kingdom is not easy. For too long, that has meant too much to us and has proven way too much to us. Isn't that right? Isn't that right, Lucy? For too long, we looked at that stuff, and he said, oh, man, you know, you know they've got 3,000 people in that building on a Sunday morning. We're lucky to have three, <laughs> <laughs> including the deity of Christ, <laughs> you know, and the Holy Spirit and the Trinity. You know, just Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are the three we got. <laughs> <laughs> They don't show up. We don't have anybody. <laughs> but that's good. <laughs> As it should be. <laughs> yeah, I might as well have a little fun with it. Anyway, so we're so wired to that, this rewiring, so that when I don't feel good, that does not affect the kingdom. See where God's going with this? The law was outward, and they tell me the Jews were not affected by the outward. When Jesus tried to take it away from them, they murdered him. When he tried to move them to the internal kingdom, they killed him. You think the church is going to do less? You, just hear me, you threaten their stuff and see what happens. This can't be God. Oh, so God doesn't ever do anything without letting you know it. <laughs> I'm a prophet, and he always tells me. <clears throat> yeah, right. <laughs> How do you spell prophet? <laughs> P-R-O-F-I-T? <laughs> oh, that was brutal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really sorry, but I might be one day. <laughs> Probably when I stand before the Lord. <laughs> I can't believe you said that. <laughs> I'm having trouble even remembering it. <laughs> Wish I could forget. So anyway, no, my friends, this rewiring is such, to such an extent, away from the outward man, the outward life. Again, it doesn't mean there's not a reality out there. It doesn't mean the Lord can't manifest himself in it, but the internal kingdom is what he's after, and it's what he's building. I guarantee you this. You may have a dozen times where the Lord reveals himself I'm saying appears before you with your naked eye, and you say, man, that's God. 
But his desire is to appear here in you because that's where he lives. Can you hear that? Believe me, what you, is more effective than that appearing out there is Christ in you. That's where transformation to his image takes place. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. And if you're looking for transformation, which Romans 8, we've been predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ, it demands the inward kingdom. Not outward appearances or even going to heaven and seeing him on the throne. Again, I've done all that multiple times. It continues to happen to me. And I've asked the Lord to take it. So why would you do that? Because of the battle. But the Lord said, no, no, it's best that I test you by continuing to do this outwardly to drive you further inwardly. Such as the test. You say, man, it's, you're blessed to have those things. Cursed would be more like it. I'm not kidding. It's the internal that matters, and it's eternal. And this is passing away. Please hear that. And our seeking for the Lord, let it be the internal kingdom relationship that we've been predestined for. You want to know why God doesn't give these outward experiences to everyone? That he only picks on certain ones? Because <laughs> he loves you more than he loves me. <laughs> I'm playing. But you and people think, oh, he must really love you to do that. That's not true. It doesn't have anything to do with it. He loves us the same. He's not bringing temptation your way by appearing in such ways. The temptation to make that your relationship rather than right here. That's the truth. We should get down on our knees and thank God for keeping us from stumbling and having a relationship that's built in the outer court. Can you hear that? The outer court are those appearances. Inwardly, the inner inward holy of holies is Christ in you. That's the movement the Father's after, Brian. I probably shouldn't say this. Because of the, the revelations. For years, for years, that was my relationship with the Lord. I spent a lot of time before the Lord and with the Lord and stuff was happening whether I was sleeping, awake, it wouldn't matter. It still happens. I don't go seeking it anymore like I used to. What I'm seeking is the Christ within, Christ himself, not a kingdom thing. Christ is the kingdom I'm seeking. It happens to be the kingdom of Christ, Christ within, though. But it continues to come. Angels, all the dynamics that go on with it. So there's nothing wrong with that. Angels minister in an outer court arena. Christ alone in the interior. Can you hear that? Yes. Angels have things they do for us by God's assignment, outwardly. It's outward. But no one ministers to your inner man but Christ alone. Yes. Angels can't touch the inner man, and they know it. We need to learn it. Do they have something to do? They absolutely do, and they do what the Lord wants them to do and assigns them to do. But it's outward. It's not going to help my or your inward man at all. They can defeat whatever demonic principality is coming against you. That's not going to do anything for your inner man. Not a bit. Just want to be clear. So am I saying, well, let's just, you know, that's, no, that's not even needed? It is needed. That's why the outward stuff happens. There's, there's a dynamic to it. They're fighting demonic powers, demonic forces, restraining in an outward way. But when it comes to restraining me, it demands the Spirit of Christ in me. They can't do it. It's not within their power. 
It's Christ alone. So when you read the angelic order at war, keep that in mind. They have their sphere. They have their mission. They have their assignments. It's outward. The inward kingdom belongs to Christ and us, his kingdom. The inward. Isn't that beautiful? I'm telling you, the invitation to us is quite incredible. The angels know it. They long to look into this. They do not have Christ in them, and they never will. Entirely different created purpose for the angels. But you were created to be a temple of God. God live in you. Incredible. Wasn't that incredible, brother? God, I don't understand it. I said it last night, talk about your fixer upper. But God wants to come and live inside of us. Why? I can't figure. But that's, his, that's the predetermined plan of God. It's forever existed. Never entered into his mind and me. Nothing ever does. So let's go forward here. <clears throat> faith, then, the faith of the Son of God, we're going to look at Hebrews 11 here, is the substance then. Let's bring that word into view. Okay? You with me? Faith as the substance. Now, again, we're not talking about man's faith. We're talking about the faith of the Son of God in us, Christ being the substance. And that's how this must be understood. So uh, verse 1 of Hebrews 11, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen, or faith is the substance. I like that word because that brings Colossians 2 into view, where Paul says Christ is the substance. The substance belongs to Christ. Same Holy Spirit, same scriptures, actually the same person writing both books. It was never questioned for 1,200 years. They never questioned who wrote the book of Hebrews. They knew it was Paul. It's only modernism that we don't know who wrote that. Of course you don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's because you don't know who it's written about. <laughs> Sorry to say it that way, but it's the truth. You got to know who it's written about to know who wrote it. Anyway, faith is the substance, or faith is Christ. So here's what it's saying that the substance Christ that Christ is of faith is not proven. Here's what this scripture is saying, by any outward thing. It is not evidenced by anything you can see. It is an inward kingdom. That's what that scripture is declaring. Christ in you is not going to be determined by the sense realm at all. Your five senses. It's determined by what's called the faith of the Son of God. Are you with me? I pray that Christ will arise in you and I right now, the faith of the Son of God, to believe Him. Believe in Him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or imagine, above all you could ever do. Because you can't get yourself there. You cannot make yourself godly. Only Christ can. You cannot be good enough. This is not performance-based Christianity. It's not based around going to church, based around meetings. It's based around Christ in you. And if we're going to have meetings, let it be Christ coming forth among us and in us, or it's useless. Let's just go have a pancake breakfast or something like that. Let's go have a barbecue. Don't get me started. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> says that at least we'll get some food somewhere <laughs> worth the eating. <laughs> I 
I get so tired of vomiting over the spiritual nonsense going on, I like good food. <laughs> that was an excuse. <laughs> it is the truth, though. <laughs> so, for by it, the men of old gained approval. I want you to ponder that passage right there. What do you think, Stephen? Is that an important passage? How did the men and women of old gain approval? Faith in Christ. Now, ours is not simply faith in Christ. That's what I want us to realize. Christ in you now is the faith of the Son of God in you. It's no longer just directed toward him. It's, come, it's a spring coming up out of you called Christ. There's a river flowing out of you, meant to, called Christ. And in that river is all that the kingdom of Christ is. Faith, love, isn't that right? Love and peace and, and joy. Long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness, temperance, self-control, patience. That's the source of that is not you and I. The source of that is Christ in us. Say, so, man, I don't have enough patience. That's because we don't have enough Jesus. I don't, I, no, that's the truth. I can't love you. That's what we're actually saying then is I'm not going to allow God to love through me. God's not coming to increase our love. He's coming to love through us. Yes. See what I'm saying? There's the kingdom within, Christ in you. He is everything man cannot be. And he's meant to be everything to man. Isn't that beautiful? God gave us exactly who and what we need, Christ. The church is searching, isn't it, John? It's looking, what's the next thing? When are we going to get back to the person, the eternal thing God gave, and that's all that's needed? <laughs> Recovery is about bringing the person forward into this moment in us. That's recovery. So by it, the men of old, is they don't even have Christ in them. But they were approved because they put their trust in the person. Isn't that right? Enoch knew the person and was in love with him. David knew the person. Deborah knew the person. Get the point? We do, don't we? We get it. They're in love with the Lord, and they know the Lord even without him being in them. Now, we are really without excuse. He's in us. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. Don't, don't you get excited? I'm, don't you at least get your pinky finger twitching? <laughs> <You know? laughs> at least that amount of excitement. Oh, oh, it's starting. There it is. <laughs> There's more to it than the outward. There's a reality. Is he not a fire shut up in our bones? Is not coming spirit to spirit within you. It's like the guys on the road to Emmaus. But not our hearts burning within us as the Lord unveiled himself to them. I pray that the unveiling of the Lord in this moment will be that to us. Did not our hearts ablaze with a fresh confidence called the faith of the Son of God in me. To believe him who is able to get me where I can't go. To bring in a kingdom that he is without my being able to do a thing about it except say yes. Is that not true? To have utter and total forever confidence that doesn't come from man. That he is able that he who began a good work in us, brother, isn't that the truth? Is able to bring it to completion. There's the faith of the Son of God, and Satan's going to battle you on this internal kingdom along this line of trust and faith in the Son of God. You're going to see yourself in the mirror. That's the outer court arena, and if we're living in the outer court, that's that outer court arena. There are two elements in the outer court. There was the brazen altar. There's, there's the born again experience right there in the outer court though there's one other element that was in the outer court there was this this bronze 
laver filled with water. And they had to, both before they went into the, the inner court and Holy of Holies, they had to wash their hands. And when they came back out, they had to wash themselves again. Wash their feet. It's picturing this cleansing going on, but that's not all that happened. When they stepped up to that labor, they it acted like a mirror because it was burnished bronze. And they could see themselves. They could see, let me say it this way, they could see self. Whether they knew that or not, we better. They could see self. Now, the objective is to see the Lord. But we need a distinction between self and the Lord. Isn't that right or not right? Yes. So here's that outer court relationship. You're born again. You're being cleansed regularly by the water of the Word, Christ being the Word. He is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. He's the new beginning of the new creation is the word Christ is. Not what is written alone, the word Christ is. It was the word in Genesis who spoke and everything came into existence. Colossians is clear. Christ created everything. Every bit of that's been created, he created. He is the creator. And he is the head of the new creation in us. Is that not true? He is the word here to this creation, and he is the word here to the new creation, the inward kingdom. That's absolutely true. That's a whole other message, Brian, but I'll let you preach that one. <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> he remains the word throughout the contest. I want you to hear that. That's why it's so important to understand him as the one who speaks. Here, what are you doing, Terry? Here's what I want to say to you. Yes, there's a throne up there and the voice from the throne. Absolutely, but that's not transforming. He is, here it is, building a throne in us. And it's the voice of him from this throne that transforms yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. He can transform and create all that he wants to out there, but in us it demands the throne here, the kingdom within, the throne being built in you and me. That voice there will transform, will cause this eternal, internal kingdom to be realized in a people. He rules by his voice, and he will right inside of you. Isn't he wonderful? Just, let's just praise him for a second. You are worthy to be praised, Lord. You are the worthy one. There is none worthy but you, Lord. That's our declaration. No one else is worthy but Christ and Christ alone. The Father knows that. The Spirit of God knows that. The Father's determined that all glory come to the Son, and the Son is equally determined that that glory go back to the Father. You're worthy, Lord. You will have a people. You will have a people who are a kingdom. Listen to this because this is another step in this process, a kingdom of priests. God help us to not simply be priests who never get out of the outer court. The reason for getting washed is to go to the inner court at least. Is that not true? Anyway. So let's go on. By faith, we understand, verse 3, that the worlds were, I love this, prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which were visible. You know what that's written? Here's the word of the Lord to us. Do you believe? Because you can't see with the natural eye this internal kingdom, but it's there. What's its substance? Christ. When nothing outward can show it, is it real? It absolutely is. Just as certain as he created from nothing everything outward. So this new creation of the kingdom within, 
is nothing more than God himself inside us. And if we can believe that he created that, why can't we equally, here's the point of it, believe Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's why he's bringing it up. I believe the word Christ of God that Christ is in me. Don't you? By new birth. I believe that. And if I believe that, he is the completeness of all that the Godhead desires. And he, was, he is able to get us there. He is able. I want to say that to you. He's able. How do you know that, Terry? By the faith of the Son of God in me. I have no question about it whatsoever. He is able. The storms are going to hit. The tests and trials are going to come. God's going to see to it. My declaration is standing firm on the rock that Christ is in against any storm. I believe. Not in the things. I believe in him. These things can wreck all my outward stuff and not touch this fortress that Christ is inside of me. This kingdom that's within. It can only destroy the outward. It cannot touch the internal kingdom of Christ and the love of Christ. Is that not beautiful? Yes. You are unmoved in the storm because he loves me. And it has nothing to do with that stuff. <laughs> That's the truth. It's the beauty of Christ in you. It's the certainty. It's as certain as God existing. That's the point of the book of Hebrews. Point that he created it all from nothing. How does that work? I don't need to know. I just know he's able. I know he's able to create all that he wants to create. I know he's able to finish the work in a new creation called you and I. That's the faith of the Son of God in operation. That's not my faith conquering something, John. It's the faith of Christ in me. I have believed in him who is able. When's he not been able? <laughs> That's the battle. This is 1 John chapter 4, and here is your victory, even your faith. Go read it. It becomes your faith when he comes in. <laughs> That's how it becomes yours, and you believe it. Isn't that beautiful? It is a faith that brings the righteousness of Christ into you. Can you believe that? That's incredible. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 3. A righteousness by faith. Incredible. You mean, that's exactly right. Abraham was declared righteous because he believed in the Lord. Incredible, guys. Incredible. He's made righteous because he puts his trust in the Lord Jesus. Just like you and I. There is no law when Abraham's there. There doesn't need to be one. He has a relationship with the person. The, the law was added because of unbelief. Can you see that? They would not trust the person, Brian, so he gives them the law to drive them to the person. That's the purpose of the law, get you to the person, not become a religion that you can't let go of. <laughs> he did not give us Christianity. He gave us Christ. <laughs> He's been lost. In the shuffle. We think righteousness comes by the stuff we do or don't do, and I'm here to tell you, that's a lie, my friends. My brothers, my sisters, it's a lie. Christ is the only source of righteousness. And how is it accessed? By believing in the person. He comes in, the righteousness of God. That's in Christ. It was that declaration reinstated by Martin Luther that turned the world upside down. The just shall live by faith. Changed the entire world, didn't it, Larry? Why? That's because it brings Christ back in. And that's what we're looking at. Brian's right. Here at the end, you're going to see a people. Christ is in them in an inward kingdom. And they are unshakable, it does not. And they're going to, I'm telling you, read the book of Revelation. 
They're going to be shaken. They're going to be murdered. They're going to be killed. And it doesn't matter to them because they are indestructible by the power of an incorruptible, indestructible life called Christ right inside of them. Kill me. That's okay. But you can't stop Christ. The death of his saints will only make the ground ready for the greatest inward harvest of the kingdom in hearts that's ever been. I'm saying this to you. I'm not talking about numbers. I'm talking about those who are unstoppable because of the Christ in them. Daniel describes it this way. They'll know their God and exploits will go on. The unbelievable will happen. Now, I don't look at that and say, well, it's just about miracles. Those things, miracles are going to be so common in this, they'll never be preached. Christ only will be. <laughs> That's the truth of this. We'll lose our sense of awe around all outward things because we have been captured by a person. And when you've seen him, that stuff means nothing. I'm not saying I'm not thankful for what he can do, but it isn't him. He's him. I'm in love with him, not what he can do. Can you hear what I'm saying? It will free him to do anything, Lucy, because he can trust us and say, you're safe to me. I can do this, and you're not going to get your eyes over here. You're going to keep them right on me. That's where we're headed. Right now, he's restraining this to get our eyes on him and make us safe, build an internal kingdom right here. That's what he's doing. Anyway, I know you know all that, but I just remind you. That's the purpose going on here. All right, so let's go on. By faith, let's jump to verse 5. I mean, you look at by faith. It doesn't make any sense until you see that their faith is in the Son of God. Then it makes sense. It's not faith for the stuff that's going on. It's the faith of the Son of God that causes it to go on. That's the way it works. My faith is in the person. He can do whatever he wants to say or not. <laughs> it's this kind of dynamic. We're the three Hebrew guys. Our God's able to deliver us. We're certain of that. But if he doesn't, we're still not bowing. <laughs> Either way, guys, we're free. <laughs> doesn't matter. Do your worst. If I die, I'm the benefactor of that. Go ahead and get me out of this body. That's fine with me. <laughs> Seriously. If it's my time to go, I'm there, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Just think, today may be the day that it's our time to go. Anyway, I don't want to rush it. But if you do, do feel murder in your heart, please give expression to it. Go ahead and kill me. <laughs> Now that's a first for the, you might want to scratch that one later, brother. When you had to, <laughs> I said that to y'all, not everybody else that this is going to. <laughs> I'm choosy as to who kills me. <laughs> I want it to be my friends. <laughs> All right. All right. By faith, Enoch was taken up. What does that have to do with faith? His faith is in the person. And the person decides to take him. Isn't that beautiful? Our faith is in Christ, and it's of Christ. I don't need to know what's going to happen. I just need to know him. He's where it happens. <laughs> Isn't he? And uh, he's Jehovah Sneaky anyway. <laughs> he's full of surprises. I love that about him. It's like what's said of Aslan. He's not a tamed lion. <laughs> God happens to believe he's God and believes he can pretty much do what he wants to do when he wants to do it, whether we like it or not. He didn't ask my permission either. That doesn't mean he doesn't love me. He does love me. But it's not performance-based, and it's not a love that says, hey, he did this for me, therefore he loves me. That's not true. He loves me whether he does anything. He's already done everything he needed to do, gave himself. Isn't that true? So anyway, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. 
By the way, I'm going to look at my watch to see just how late it is. 11.31. Not that late. <laughs> anyway, so he should not see death. And he was not found because God took him. He didn't even have Christ in him. But he knew the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? He knew the Lord. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And listen to this. Now, that's the setup for this verse. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. Enoch, like Abel, like Abraham, like Noah, you read the list here. The commonality of all these men and women was their faith in the person. Christ was the object of their faith, not themselves or anything outward. Christ alone. That's biblical faith. Its source now in us is Christ in us. The Lord outside of them was still giving them his faith, that even though it was coming from without. But that's not true of us. Now it's bubbling up like a river within or spring, springing up within us, a well. Isn't that true? Christ in you. I say this to you. Everything of life and godliness is already in you, in Christ. Stop searching for the next thing when the one is in you. Can you hear that? I'm not looking. I said it last night. I'm not looking for some great move out here in the outer court. I'm looking for us to get to the Holy of Holies. That's where the Father is coming from. It's what he said. I want an inward movement that moves my people out of the outer court and into the relationship we were meant to have, by the way, of Christ in you called the Holy of Holies. You know what I know. In the outer court, again, there's the brazen altar. There's this brazen labor in the inner court. Get this now, the inner court. Still not to Christ. Did you hear what I just said? Still not to the fullness that God wants in the relationship. You've got the candelabra where it represents the scriptures. You've got, get this, the bread of the presence. So there's a presence that's outward and not inward of God. And are we satisfied with an outward presence instead of an inward one, an inward kingdom? Are we satisfied? Let me just get right with it. Are we satisfied with just feeling the presence rather than having the presence within. Amen. That's the point of the, that table and the bread of the presence. Will we stop right there? We just need the presence. Yeah, right here. That can be undetectable by the, the five senses. Can you hear that? And there's a kind of praying that's in that inner court. Still not Christ. Can you hear that? There's an altar of incense that's in the inner court. Still a veil between that and the covenant that Christ is, the ark. I'm afraid the veil's being re been re-erected. And Christ has become veiled again. The truth of it is, you know, once the veils come down, Hebrew states this clearly, that altar of incense was moved into the Holy of Holies, meaning it came into Christ. That there was a heavenly ground praying concerning the person that we were to be brought into that kind of prayer. We can become satisfied with the Scripture so much that Scripture's become our deity. 
and we miss the person. Is that not true? <clears throat> we can become, oh, the scriptures, the scriptures. What about the person? Do you know him? If the scriptures are not getting you to the person, the scriptures have become a false deity to your heart. <clears throat> That's the menorah. That's the candelabra. I want to tell you something. Can you hear what I'm about to say or not? You'll see. All that stuff's not representing Jewishness. It's representing Christ. Can you hear that? It has nothing to do with the Jews. It has everything to do with Jesus. The entire tabernacle is a representation of Christ. Not people, any people, anywhere, anytime. Not the church, Christ. Can you hear that? Yes. Law, Jews, Gentiles, there's no such thing in Jesus. They don't exist. There is no Jew in Jesus. No more than there's a Gentile. There's only his people. That is the clear teaching of the scriptures. That's the problem. We're still living in an old covenant relationship with God. An altar of incense back there. Isn't that right, John? An altar of incense and the bell's not been pulled down and the altar's not been brought into Christ. All altars. Every single one of them. Our relationship is not outer court, my friends. It's not meant to, it begins there. It's not meant to stay there. Our relationship's not even the inner court. Being able to quote Bible verses and know this and know that about the Scripture. It's the person. It's not an outward presence. I can feel the presence of the Lord. I know he's with me. But what about if you can't feel him? Is he not with you now? Is that the way it works? What about when you have a bad day, a bad weekend? You don't feel anything and you become numb because of pain and suffering in your body. When you can't feel anything, that means God's not with you? It does not mean that. He is beyond our senses. That stuff he created called your five senses must not judge him. You're not with me because I can't feel you. Where are you, God? I'm inside you, you idiot. <laughs> Sorry, but that's just the one. That's blunt. That's a Greek word called idios. It means one's own. It's talking about the self. That's where it comes from. That's why I used it. That's the self-centeredness that belongs in the outer court. We're judging God. We are judging God. We are calling God a liar with such statements. I can't feel you. Where are you? You calling me a liar? Let me put it blunt to you. You calling him a liar? You think he's not a God of his word? And if he's not, how can we trust him at all? Well, that's hardcore, isn't it? Comes right down to where we live. We're either going to believe him or believe our circumstances. Believe him or believe your test. Believe him or believe your trial. Elevate your trial to be bigger than him. You're either going to believe him or you're going to believe what the government says. <laughs> or governments, if you look at the nations. You're going to believe the Lord or you're going to believe people. Believe the Lord or believe your preacher. It's not the preacher we need to be believing in. It needs to be the Lord. And if the preacher's not getting us to the Lord, they're not worth their salt. And I won't say what else I feel about it. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> without faith, it's impossible to please him. Here's the fight. For we who come to God must, underline that, you must, you must believe that he is. Not your circumstances. You must believe he is. And that he is. Isn't this beautiful, Stephen? He is something. What is he? The rewarder of those who seek him. And if you're seeking him, guess what your reward is? Him. <laughs> now and eternally. Isn't that what's said in the Old Testament? Isn't that what's said, sister? What's said in the Old Testament? He is my exceeding great reward. That's what's said to the priesthood of the Old Testament. You won't have any land. 
I'm not allotting you any earthly thing. I'm giving you the person. That's the priesthood even of the Old Testament. All the rest of the tribes got land. The Levites didn't. They got the Lord. I will be your reward. That's what he says to them. Can you hear that from the Lord? Your reward is in not, not, not anything you have other than the Lord. That's exactly who I want. Isn't it you? We were made for him. That's what the beauty of Colossians. He created us and he created us for him. We were created for him. We were created by him. Is that not true? Read Colossians 1. So we're not only created by him, you were created for him. He wants to dwell in you. Yes. He wants you to be where he enthrones himself. I love the heart of God, don't you? I love the love that is displayed in God in this. It's not good enough. Listen to this. It's not good enough that you're just going to go to heaven. That is not going to satisfy you. That's true. But more than that, it's not going to satisfy God. God's who we're dealing with. He wants to be closer to you than that. I'm going to go up there and ride the roller coasters in heaven. There is no such thing, but some people think there are because of the delusions that they call revelations. <laughs> Did I say that right? I meant every word of it. John Wayne's still up there making movies. Some of the nonsense said that. Good night. I'm sure they're bang, bang, shoot em ups just like always. So. <laughs> I just, I, I shouldn't stop. I should say more about that nonsense. That's what happens when Christ gets lost. We have delusions and we call them revelations. And that's what's going around through the body of Christ, a bunch of delusions. I guarantee you this. When you get into that place that he's created, If you're already in the internal kingdom, you're not looking for anything but him. I guarantee you that. What does the stuff that would be outward mean to us when he has become our all in all? And the purpose, according to Ephesians 4, is that he fills everything of his creation. We're not going to, sorry to say it this way, but no, I'm not. <laughs> We're not going to a Disneyland in the sky. I think some people need the dizziness of their brain examined <laughs> as to what they're writing. I'm not trying to be unkind, but I'm going to say this, the truth. The revelation God has given is of the person who we have in us, and we're going to be with him and him in us forever. And he will completely satisfy you. And you're, I'm just going to say this. You'll have food, but you won't need it. That sounds pretty good to me. But anyway, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of a coconut cream pie right about now. <laughs> I just went from heaven to hell. <laughs> Especially if you don't like coconuts. <laughs> Anyway, man, guys, Christ is going to so satisfy us and make us hungry for more of him that we're never going to be satisfied with any outward thing. That's why heaven doesn't mean anything to God or us. Can you hear that? So I can't believe that, Terry, that heaven doesn't mean anything to you. Are, are you okay if I just love Jesus? <laughs> are, you, are you okay if I just love Jesus, you just love Jesus? I'm okay if all you want is Jesus. I'm with you. If nothing here on the outer court or the outer man satisfies me, I guarantee you it won't there. That's the lesson in all this. <laughs> There's going to be a creation that wants the Lord. That's why we were created. We were created for him. He created us for him. He didn't create us for heaven. He created us for him. He didn't create us for roller coaster rides in heaven. John Wayne movies in heaven. Starbucks in heaven. That's what's been said in some of these books. Going shopping and having to pay money to buy clothes in heaven. That's actually written. 
I can't afford it here. I certainly am not going to pay for it there. I guarantee you that. I'll stick with my robe. Thank you. <laughs> it may not be machine washable, but <laughs> that doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm not looking for a laundry mat. I'm looking for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> There's a river of life we can wash off of it. <laughs> no skinny dipping. <laughs> Go in there with your rope. <laughs> I wonder how this translates over into Korean, sister. Can you? <laughs> What does skinny dip and translate out into the Korean language? <laughs> Naked as a jaybird. <laughs> Is that the Korean translation? <laughs> I don't even want to know what it means in the Greek. <laughs> means you're in trouble. <laughs> That's what it means. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it now, the Almighty up there. Somebody give him some fig leaves. <laughs> He's abandoned his robe. <laughs> oh, well, how did we get there? <laughs> That's that drop, David. <laughs> I was just about to enter the pearly gates when <laughs> it fell out from under me. And <laughs> That's that 14,000 foot <laughs> deal, isn't it, sister? <laughs> anyway, where were we? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Lord, wanting the Lord. He satisfies us. He's the only thing that will. So. Faith, then, becomes to us the great battleground. <laughs> fight the good fight of faith, my brothers and sisters, the faith of the Son of God in you. Believe Him. Trust Him. It's easy to say, I believe and I have faith, when we're not being tested. But it's proven in the test. So one final scripture, and uh, we'll spend... Whatever time we have, we've got about 15 minutes, not quite. We'll look at this in James chapter 1. You know the passage, but I'm, I'm going to read this in the Weist translation, if I can find it. <laughs> so uh, James chapter 1, beginning uh, with verse 1. I like how it reads here. It's a, the Weist translation, it just, they just did the New Testament in it, but it's... Uh, It's much more literal to the Greek language. James, a bond servant or bond slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes, those in the dispersion, be constantly rejoicing. Consider it a matter for unadulterated joy without any admixture of sorrow whenever you fall into the midst of variegated trials. That doesn't even sound of this earth. <laughs> it's not. That's a life, Christ hidden in us. And we're rejoicing that we're being tried. Re recognizing it's coming from the Lord himself. Being allowed by the Lord. Orchestrated much of it by the Lord. You fall into in the midst of variegated trials which surround you. You ever feel like you're surrounded? Looking for the Calvary that never comes? Because <laughs> the Lord's not going to rescue us by outward things, but by driving us inward to a fortress that's unconquerable called Christ in you. Can you hear what I'm saying? We're looking for the Calvary Jesus, like the Calvary, come rescue me. We're singing songs, rescue me. I can't sing it, but maybe you can. And the Lord's not doing that. Not because he doesn't love us, because he does. He's training us.
because that's why we're here, to be trained. If he just wanted us in heaven, as soon as we got born again, he would have taken us there. But he wants something heavenly, not heaven. Can you hear that? Heaven is heaven because of someone called God who is heavenly. And I'm not ready for, let's say it this way, heaven if inwardly I'm not heavenly. There's a kingdom of God which is going to be when Christ, let's say it this way, does come outwardly. The entire Godhead is already, though, in you. But the throne is going to be moved to here and in our midst of the entire Godhead. Where's heaven then? Where the heavenly is. Where the nature is. Where his kind is. Let me be clear with you. The house he is building. Do you understand? How many have ever built a house uh, for the purpose of yourself? Did you move into it? Why did you build it if you didn't move into it? Why is God building a house if he don't plan on living in it? He aims to come right inside of us and dwell there forever. We're meant to be, as the scripture says, the dwelling place of God in the spirit. We are being living stones built together, here's Peter, to a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Anyway, I'll get to that as we look at this. So these trials, we read this out of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, they're achieving something if we turn to the Lord. They don't achieve anything if we turn away from the Lord. Everything I'm telling you is only real if you keep going toward him, keep seeking him. If you seek to run away, nothing I'm telling you is going to be real with us, with any of us. It's all a matter of them driving us to the Lord, not running away from him. <clears throat> you can come under such severe trial that you just say, that's enough. And the self-life comes up, and with, if that's what I've got to go through, I'm not doing it. There's the self-life in action. Uh, God, I, I trusted you to do this for me, and you didn't do it, and I've had enough. So you would control the Almighty, would you? <laughs> Lucifer? <laughs> well, that's blunt, wasn't it? We want the Lord to say to us, get behind me, Satan. You're not controlling the Almighty, my friends, by your needs. Not ever. That's blunt, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's the truth. That does not mean he doesn't love you. He does, but he's not giving you his throne. <laughs> That's the truth. So we would control the Almighty by our needs, and if he doesn't do what we want him to do, just like the babies we are, we'll take our little red wagon and go on. Yeah, that's really good, isn't it? We really want us on the throne. That's the problem. We're already on the throne of our own hearts. He's got to unseat you and I from our own throne. It happens to be our butts, in our case. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that was blunt. We just think it's a throne. <laughs> like, that's just really, I loved it, Michael, didn't you, brother? <laughs> it really hits home. <laughs> that's pretty much the way things are, my friends. We're thinking it's a throne, but it is. Anyway, so, but let's go on. There, you're surrounded by these trials. And if you're looking for any way out other than Christ inwardly, you're looking in the wrong direction. The point of the trial is to get you to Jesus. And you're going to take that test and take it again and take it again and take it again until you get to Jesus. How many times do we want to take the test? How many times do you need to take the test? How many times do I need to take the test? If I'll get to the Lord, the Lord will get another test ready. <laughs> Okay, son, you finally passed kindergarten. <laughs> That's what he's saying to me. Yes, that color is red. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
and your behind's going to be red if you stay doing this over and over again. <laughs> well, I discipline you. <laughs> anyway, that's way too much fun. I couldn't miss that one. So knowing experientially that the approving of your faith, don't you love that? That's not the first time this Greek word appears in the scriptures. And it's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Those who are approved of God and entrusted with the gospel. Catch his meaning? How do you get approved? By being tried and passing the tests, plural. Believing in Christ, trusting in Christ, our faith being refined by the trials and the tests. God's not interested in stopping the trial. He's interested in refining and purging us within and getting us to Jesus. That's the truth of this. Stop asking God to take away the trial. You're just going to face it again. And if he has to rescue your sinking boat, you're only going to go through it again. They went through the boat scene twice. <laughs> Didn't they? The disciples did. I just wonder how many boat scenes God's got lined up for me. <laughs> Every one of them's got a hole in it. You know that. <laughs> That's why he tells you to go out in the middle of the lake. By the time you get out in the middle of the lake, you, you know, the boat's already sinking. Then he sends the storm. Then who are you going to trust in? Your oar? <laughs> anyway, so knowing experientially that the approving of your faith, that faith having been put to the test for the purpose of being approved and having met the test has been approved. I like how that's said, don't you? that this approving process produces a patience and bears up and does not lose heart or courage under trials. But be allowing the aforementioned patience to be having its complete work in order that you may be spiritually mature and complete in every detail, lacking in nothing. That's not a, uh, let's say it this way, in Western culture, that is not the belief of Western culture, what I just read. It is absolutely where God's coming from, though. All the time, every day. These tests are not coming to us because God hates us. They're coming to us because God loves us and is wanting to test us, our faith. Let's say it this way. The faith of the Son of God in us to become our faith becomes our faith in the test, in the trial, by believing in Him. We get ownership that way. It's so spoken of, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Isn't that true? Think about it for a moment. Think of the last chapter of James where Job is spoken of. Remember the patience of Job. Remember. When he lost everything, including his children, Remember, remember, that's what God would say to us. Remember the purpose of the trial. To God, and it should become this way to me. Us approved, us coming through that fiery trial and believing is more precious to God than any gold. You're more precious to God than any gold or anything else. Anything he's created. Well, anyway, the Psalm 91 talks about this inward kingdom. 
so many of the Psalms do. I'm not saying they knew that, but we should. It's a dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, an abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. Isn't that right? Look at it in Psalm 91 there. It's a beautiful passage. May God help us in the midst of our trial with this passage. I call it the warrior psalm, but whatever battle you're going through, I'm talking about spiritual battles now, the psalms are full or filled with this dynamic. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, or the secret place of the Most High, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, my refuge and my fortress. Folks, that's, in, that's because you're in battle. That's because you're in trial. It's because you're being tested. Because we're in the storms. We're in something that would overwhelm us in the natural. But God overwhelms it spiritually. And the spiritual conquers the natural kingdom in us. The inward Christ conquers the outward man of our flesh, our soul, our self-life. This is what's in view. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions or his wings, or under his wings you have, sit, you have sought refuge. See, this is all speaking, all of this is speaking of this inward reality. That's the reason it was written. Bring it into Christ, Christ in you. The secret place, here's the problem with all outward things, is Christ in you is hidden from the outward. The natural eye can't see him. The natural ear can't hear him. The natural senses can't detect him. This is Colossians. It's what Paul writes in Colossians. Setting our affections on things above, where Christ is seated. Not on things of this earth. Then he who is your life will appear. That's not talking about the second coming. It's talking about the inward revealing of Christ in you as the kingdom. For your life is now hidden with Christ in God, he says in Colossians. Hidden. Hidden with Christ. Where? Right here. Again, retreat, not by running away, but by retreat into the person. Run to the person in you, Christ. Go into the fortress. Go stand, let's say it this way. I'm doing imagery here. Language fails us, but nevertheless, let me use the imagery, biblical imagery. Go stand on the rock that you're already standing on. But take note, I'm standing on the rock, and the storm cannot budge this rock that Christ is. Now, I don't want you or I to think when you look down, you're, you're trying to balance yourself on a pebble. <laughs> That's not Jesus. <laughs> He's not a pebble. He's bigger than all that he's created. He's that size rock. Greater than all that he's created. That size rock. Is that not true? So, we're dealing with someone whose storms can affect him. Then the key is for me and him and him and me. See what he was saying there in John? In that day you'll know that I'm in the Father. You are in me and I'm in you. Now, his being in me is born againness. Here's the great test for us in the internal kingdom. Will I be in him? He's in me, but am I in him? Am I in him in the storm? Or is he in me as a mustard seed? So I finish with these statements here concerning two passages of Scripture that are really important for us deliverance-wise. Deliverance from the outer man lies in John, or excuse me, in Matthew 17. I'm not going to read it all. You'll know it anyway. They've come down, Peter, James, and John have, with Jesus off the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, I want you to catch that. <clears throat> we want a mountaintop experience with God 
And God wants us in the valley to be tested. Can you hear that? God's not going to let Peter live on that mountain, and he's not going to let you either. <laughs> Stop trying to stay in mountaintop experiences. Stop it. Did y'all hear me? Stop that. <laughs> I'm saying that funny-wise, but it's the truth. Tell them, speak to my own heart. Stop it. Stop trying to have a mountaintop experience and stay there. Your faith is tested in the valley, not on the mountaintop. So they come down off the mountaintop, and there's a demonized individual down there, and the disciples can't get the demon out. Isn't that right? So, remember Matthew 13. Remember this passage. The kingdom is like a mustard seed planted in the ground. That would be Christ in you. The mustard seed. That's his beginning form, the size of a mustard seed. That doesn't mean you have a little bit of Jesus, a little Jesus, you just have a little bit of Jesus. You don't have a little Jesus, you have a little bit. <laughs> you have a small measurement in the beginning. I did too. Let's don't stay there, that's outer court. That's the brazen altar. Mustard seed. Well, anyway, so <clears throat> they can't get the demon out, and they ask him later, why can't we cast the demon? Because you don't have any faith. He said, you have little faith. In fact, it's so small. Here's what he says about it. If you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, which would be his beginning to be in us, you could say to this mountain, he's talking about demon possession. He's calling demon possession a mountain. You could say to this mountain, get out of my way because you're between me and God and it'd be thrown into the sea. If you have the faith of the Son of God in his entrance form, that's enough of Christ in you at the very beginning to get these mountains that have plagued our history. Can you hear that? That's his point. You got a mountain between you and the Lord, something in your past you can't get freedom of. The Lord said, look, all you need is the faith of a mustard seed. That, that's Matthew 13. He is the mustard seed. All you need is the faith of the Son of God for this thing to conquer your unbelief. You have made this thing a deity that you won't let me deal with. You talk about it all the time. You give in to it all the time. You're making this thing bigger than me. My first entrance is enough to kick that thing out. That's what he's actually saying there in Matthew 17. Why can't we get the demon out? I'll tell you why you can't get the demon out. You don't have the faith of the Son of God in you. You don't have even the mustard seed in you yet. There, Christ isn't in them. He's not in them. <laughs> and when he comes into them, it's going to be like the little mustard seed. But he's not going to stay that way because he's going to end up dominating. If he has anything to do with this, he's going to dominate the garden that's in us, this inward kingdom. Isn't that true? It's true. So this is uh, for all deliverance ministries. Listen, the key is Christ. Do not try to free the soul by the soul. Don't do it. That's a bunch of nonsense. No one really gets free, though they may be placated. They may feel good. Oh, I feel better. That's not what we're after. Freedom's going to be tested the next time the storm comes and we either allow this to arise again or it can't arise again because Christ took the mountain and threw the thing into the sea. Here's the Lord in this. Hey, guys, look. Your problem is you don't have the faith of the Son of God in you. Your problem is you don't have faith in me, and you don't have the faith of me. That's your problem. That's what he's saying. You're not letting me be big here. <laughs> That's your problem. That's what he's saying to them. That's what he said to them when they were in the boat. He's always saying that to his disciples. 
What's our problem? You don't have the faith of the Son of God. What? <laughs> you don't have the faith of the Son of God in you. You can't trust me. You don't believe in me. You say you believe in me, but when the first tough trial comes, the trying of your faith is much more precious than gold. You just give in to your past. You give in to whatever. I know this hits home. It's meant to. We've got all these shenanigans of how we get people free. Christ is the only freedom for people. Oh, God, help us here. God the Father gave his son. Isn't that right, Randall? He whom the Son makes free is free indeed. It does not say set free there. Go back and read it. Makes free. I've said this for years. Sets free is to open the cage and let the buzzard out. The problem is it's still a buzzard. <laughs> I come out in all my buzzardness. <laughs> Stinky, smelly, immune to God. <laughs> immune to dead things so that I continue to eat it. That's a problem, isn't it? You know, which shows my immunity to God. He wants to free me from the death in me. Anyway, but to set something inwardly free is to not simply open the cage and let them out. It's a transformation from a buzzard to a dove. And you stop being a buzzard feeding on dead things, the dead things of this life, the dead carnal things, the dead outward man things. He whom the Son makes free is free. Can you hear that? This mountain right here, here's, here's the faith of the Son of God in operation. I'm just going to be blunt with you. The bigger the mountain, the harder it falls. Believe that? I don't. The bigger the mountain, the easier it can fall because of Christ. The old, Satan, the old statements and these things and Satan having his hand wrapped up in them, bound up in them. So I'm not saying ease is on our part. Ease is on the Son of God's part. That's who we got to get involved in this. I've had the Lord say that to me. Step aside, son, and let me at them. <laughs> That's why he'll say it to me many times in these fights. Get out of the way. Let me at them. We're dealing with a mighty warrior named Jesus. Amen. He has no fear. <laughs> He's already won. We're not here bringing a fresh victory. We're establishing the victory of Christ in the situation. We are bringing the victor, victory of Christ right against the demonic powers and against our own soul, our own self-life. We're bringing Christ the victory, the conqueror, right into it. That's why he's get out of the way. Step aside. It's like Peter preaching there in Acts. And, you know, he's, he's going to the Gentiles, so he's nervous. So he's preaching there in Acts 8. And uh, he's going long. And the Lord finally just, I, that's enough. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit just comes on him right in the middle of his preaching. Shuts Peter up, finally. <laughs> Shuts Peter up because the Lord comes. Let me say this to you. Every mountain that you have in your life is meant to be cast into the sea. Even if you have the faith, that's where the context of that passage is there in Matthew 17. If you have the faith of a mustard seed, Matthew 13, the mustard seed that Christ is put into the ground. If you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can say to that mountain, get out of my way. That's where the Lord's coming from. This is that inward kingdom I'm talking about. This is the reset button to all the putting away of your former life. My friends, can you hear what I'm about to say? Christ in you is the end of your former life. You didn't exist. You don't exist. That man doesn't exist anymore. You're in a completely new creation. And completely new creation man because the life in you is Christ and it's a, it's a other than life than your former man. This life versus that life of Adam, the life of Christ. This life of Christ cannot be conquered. 
He is the conqueror. He is the victor. That's 1 John 4. Your victory is in your faith in Christ. So is your righteousness. So is everything else. Christ, the source of righteousness. Christ, the source of faith. Christ, the source of justification. Christ, the truth. Christ, the way. Christ, the life. Christ, all things pertaining to life and godliness. That's the issue. But we're trying to get godly without the Son of God. We're trying to get to God without Jesus. If you can see it. We're trying to become Christ-like without Christ. Man, if I do this, what if I fast, I'll become more spiritual? No, you'll just become skinny. <laughs> Fasting can't make you spiritual. If you're going to fast, get to Jesus. I'm not saying don't fast. If the Lord leads you into the fast, great. But he's not doing that to make you spiritual. He's not. He's doing it to get you to the Lord. He may restrain you from eating or restrain you. Maybe a different type of fast. He may restrain you from something else. But the point is not restraining the outward man in that moment. It's getting us to the inward kingdom of Christ. That's the whole point in this stuff. We make it the act. I, I mean, I just came off a 40-day fast. I'm on a spiritual mountain. Well, there's a demonized individual, probably yourself, down in the valley, and you're going to encounter them in a mirror-to-mirror, face-to-face way <laughs> as soon as you get through with this. How many have found that to be true? Now, let me see your hands. How many have come off of a spiritual high, and then the Lord show you what you really are like? Yeah, I appreciate you raising your hand. That's, that's the truth. Uh, here's, here's the way the Lord does that. I mean, honestly, here's where the Lord's coming from. Reality check, Terry. It's still me and you, not you. <laughs> 25 trillion years from now, it'll still be Christ my righteousness. Uh, what are you saying, Terry? I'm saying you're not becoming something. He is. Can you hear that? You're not going to become like God. You're going to only have God in you, Christ. Like one day I'll be so holy. No, you'll have Christ. Just the same Christ you have right now. See, we think God's here to make me strong. He's here for Christ to be your strength. We think God's here to give me love. He's here to give me his son, the son of his love. That's what he's called, the beloved. All things, all things pertaining to life and godliness are only Christ in you. That's the gospel that we preach. It is the one and only gospel, by the way. If any man preach another gospel, let him be accursed. You better know you got the right one if you're going to make that statement, and that's exactly what Paul says. There's one gospel, Christ himself. And anybody preaching everything else, let him be accursed. Strong statement, isn't it, Brian? Can you believe I'm saying it? I'm just quoting Galatians. There's an absolute in this. Christ happens to be it. This is not up for grabs. Your gospel, my gospel, everybody's gospel. There's one gospel, the person. And if you're preaching any other, I pray this for everybody preaching things besides Christ. I pray, pray they come under the curse of God, which they're already under. I do. And wake them up before it's too late. So they may preach Christ, coming from inward revealing of Christ. Preach Christ and him crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, foolishness to the Greek-minded people, but to us, Christ, the wisdom of God, Christ, the power of God. Amen. May there be a curse come on this nation for the pulpit, to the pulpit that is preaching the nonsense of an Americanized gospel and by the curse drive us back to the person. That's my ending prayer. May my heart, I ask this, may God curse this outer man land and drive me to a land called Christ flowing with milk, there's for the babies, and honey. Is that not right? Drive us to the right land, an inward kingdom. Get me to the right kingdom, into the right race here. That's my prayer. Stand with me. I want us to cry, not just for our own hearts, but for this nation.
This nation's destiny is not linked to D.C. This nation's destiny is linked, like all nations, linked to Christ. If there's any hope for any nation, it's Christ. And it doesn't matter what nation it is, all of them. We all have one hope in this, the person. We ask, Lord, for the arising of Christ in your people again. There's hope for the nation right there. No other hope. This battle cannot be won in the political arena. I'm not saying don't vote. I'm telling you to vote. But I'm telling you you're not going to win it that way. This battle is a spiritual battle, and it can only be won by Christ in him through his people. Guns aren't going to win it, though they may become necessary. <laughs> I ask, Lord, for a revolution back in the church, a getting back to the person of Jesus Christ. I ask, Lord, for an inward kingdom revelation. This Revelation 14, this eternal gospel that's an internal kingdom. I ask, Lord, that Christ, that internal kingdom, arise within us. He take this inward ground that for too long he's remained a mustard seed in, and that he began to increase and increase and increase and arise and arise and arise above the outward man and arise above all outward things and be greater than any storm, bigger than any mountain in me. For you certainly are, Lord. You certainly are. I ask that our past not be our present reality because of Christ in us. I pray that the strongholds, the mountains of our past, be broken by the present Christ, moving off of the ground of a mustard seed unto the dominating of our entire inward man. You are able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask in this or even imagine. We cannot imagine that kind of freedom. I tell you, it's a reality already in the person. Get into him. Go into the one who's in you, and you will find absolute freedom. You'll find an entirely other world. So be it, Lord in your people. I ask you be the son that you are that makes us free. I ask, Lord, that in the next battle that's going to begin probably this afternoon, <laughs> if not sooner, <laughs> whenever it begins, probably when you get in the car, try to leave the parking lot. My car breaks down right in front of yours. <laughs> I'm playing. But whatever the battle is, that for the next battle, I take note of this ahead of time, to put my trust completely in him and retreat into him. Come in. That's what he's saying. Come in. Come in to the Prince of Peace. Come in to a rest where you cease No longer I, but Christ living in me. Come in. Come to me is his invitation. And come into him. He's in you. Come into him. I have decided, Lord, for you to be my home, for you to be my resting place, for you to be the kingdom that I live in. I've decided for you to be the house I dwell in, Christ. For in you are many dwelling places, enough for all of us yes. and more. There, Lord, and there alone is rest. Can you hear it? Enter into his rest. Enter into his victory. Enter into his life that is abundant, greater than all outward things.
Enter in. Enter in. We come in, Lord. We come in. We come in not as conquerors. We come into the conqueror that he and us may make us more than a conqueror. It's one thing to be a conqueror yourself. It's another thing to have someone in you who's more than a conqueror. Because he's more than that. Way more. So, Lord, we come in right now in lieu of the week that this is the beginning of and the rest of this month and the months and years to follow. Everything changes in the outward man. Nothing changes in the inward kingdom. Christ forever the same yesterday, today, and forever. I thank you for that, Lord. May the faith of the Son of God be released in us even now as a greater measure of the Lord is released in us. A confidence that has no external explanation. A confidence that has no external reason. It is resting on no external thing. It rests on Christ and Christ alone. I saw something for you, brother. This is before the meeting. I want to say this to you. Uh, you and your wife both. I saw coming up out of you when you guys were, you were singing it, a proclamation of the Lord. Uh, it, it was, uh, I said this, you'll know what I mean. It was a prophetic proclamation of the Lord coming up out of you in the song of the Lord that was stunning, stunning. I was watching it as though it had already happened when I was sitting over here. And I want to say to you, there's, there is this shift going on in the spirit. It's not that it's had no beginning, but I'm saying it's coming with a force of the spirit in proclamation of him coming up out of you guys and others, but I saw it with you two particularly, that is going to be stunning as he is declared in song. Declared. I just want to share that with you. I ask, Lord, for all of us, a new day, God's eternal one. The day Jesus spoke of when he said, in that Day, you will know that I'm in the Father, you are in me, and I am in you. John 14. I ask for that day of the inward kingdom to be highlighted today and set the precedence for every day following for the rest of our journey. I ask that, Lord. I do not know what the day that is tomorrow holds, but I absolutely know who holds every day because he holds me and he holds you. And so I ask, Lord, for that inward confidence of Christ to face all our tomorrows with an inward kingdom confidence reality. Christ in me greater than what's in this world greater than what's coming the, tomorrow and any day following. In the name of Jesus, amen. Bless you guys. That was incredible. So, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. really confirmed what you were sharing earlier. I just wanted to share. Um, thank God he gives us signs in the heavens and uh, for times in the seasons, and not just physically, but spiritually. So some of you may know this, but um, let's see, hold on. Revelation 12, <laughs> Revelation 12 appeared in the sky last year and culminated in September. Jupiter entered the body, entered the body of, hold on. Well, my phone. Okay, sorry. This is really, yeah. Could you hold on a second? My phone is about to go dead. That's what the problem is. Okay. Um, 
Jupiter entered the body of Virgo for 42 weeks. This began the week that Jordan got pregnant. This does not occur, occur regularly in the constellations. Jupiter symbolizing the king exited Virgo, which is the, the virgin constellation, on September the 9th, on the 23rd. The sun was placed over her shoulder and the moon at her feet of Virgo. Then there was the rare alignment of three stars joining the nine of Leo that are above her head to form the 12 star crown. And then my battery just went out. <laughs> but it's the whole, what you're saying. And, and actually a couple weeks after that, it's not on there, but um, Drago came in under her feet, which is the dragon of Revelation 12. And so it's this whole inward movement in the birthing of the man child and the bride. So yeah. just wanted to confirm yeah. that. Amen. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just really quick. I want, I, I've got a word to share, but first I want us to take up an offering. Um, I just want to encourage us to give generously. I, I want us to give generously. Um, in the church today, the truth is not preached because ministers fear if they really preach the truth, they won't have the income they need. I want us to make a statement in our generosity today that says, if, if the truth of God is preached without any kind of watering down, it, it, that the people of God who love the Lord will give generously and make a statement of that. Amen. Can we do that? Um, it, that I mean, this was such an, today's message was incredible and uh, so much great revelation. And so I just want, I want us to bless Terry and Donna and Josiah and their family and just bless them with our generosity to say, thank you to God for sending us you here and for preaching the truth. Um, let's go ahead and we'll, we'll take up the offering. If you're writing out any cash that's given, we'll give it directly to Terry. Um, if you're writing a check, if you can make it out to Restoration Life. Um, and then just if it's, if you're giving to Terry, just put Terry. If you're writing to your tithe and offerings for the church, just write tithe, just so we can know how to distinguish that. But Lord, let, let's pray real quick over the offering. Lord, I just want to pray right now over this offering, Lord, that you would move on our hearts to give generously, Lord, and just to say thank you to the incredible uh, deposit of truth and revelation that was given to us. Lord, I just say thank you for Terry and Josiah and Donna and their whole family. And just we are truly grateful for all the revelation you brought. Incredible stuff. And Lord, we pray that, Lord, you would just bless this time of giving in Jesus Christ's name. We pray. Amen. And when we're done with the offering, I, I have one thing I want to pray, and then we'll end. All right, so um, I want to pray just, just where you're at. Just stand up where you're at. I want to pray what I felt like the Lord put on my heart to pray over us. I'm not going to go into the I had a dream about this. I'm not going to go into the details about it, but I just want to pray Revelation or uh, John chapter 14, verse 21 over us, that he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and disclose myself to him. I, I believe God is giving us an invitation today that have come, that God is, 
inviting us into a greater, a greater dining with him, a greater fellowship with him, a greater revelation of Jesus. And also, if you read down in uh, verse 23, that uh, the Lord says, we will come and make our abode with you in a greater place of dining and intimacy. I'm going to pray that over us to end this, uh, this conference. And so, Father, we just pray right now. Thank you for this invitation. And Father, we pray that you would come to us, just like it says in, this, in John chapter 14. You would come to us, and you would give us a much greater revelation of Jesus Christ. That you would give to us a much greater revelation of your love. That we, you would bring us into a much greater experience of your dining. That we could dine with you in a deep, intimate, personal, internal relationship with you, Lord. And Lord, I just want to pray over everyone who is here that you would bring us into that deep, intimate experience with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that, Lord, you would seal the work you have done in this conference, God. You would seal it by the blood of Jesus. And, Lord, we want to thank you for everything you did. Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, and then today, God. Just incredible things, the incredible work you did. Lord, we don't take that lightly. And, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand just to say thank you to the Lord for all he did. It was so good. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming, and just have an incredible day, incredible week. She was always better than that. You put a refrigerator for a couple of days.